Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for giving the talk. We've got 11, so we'll start. Peter Vold will talk about cockpit. So, as we got the time to start, I will hand over the mic. Thank you. Uh, most of the cockpit 
uh, the, what you see is written in JavaScript. And that, that JavaScript code is essentially running inside a long Linux session. Just as if that user was on the command line interacting with the APIs in the system in the same way. Um, having the same permissions and restrictions as that logging user would, um, doing it in the future. So, a modern Linux system has a lot of uh, different APIs that you know you use to configure or interact with you know, various parts of the system. Some of the APIs are very obvious. Um, Dbus APIs are really nice. Uh, REST APIs we believe we can use. System D is a great example. Uh, it's got lots of Dbus APIs uh, doing all sorts of stuff. They're reactive, you know, probably doing some context changes, signals. We really know what's happening with those access in the system. Uh, others are maybe a little more chat uh, aren't so obvious. Uh, you might have to spawn a process to do something. Um, look at what's going on and send it and it out. Um, or maybe you have to like, open a file somewhere. Listen to something in prop. You know, there's a lot of different APIs. So uh, let's look at how Cockpit works with this. This is the host name change example that we um, did earlier. So here is we're typing JavaScript code uh, in the browser on the console. Um, this is the one line we use to tell copy JavaScript that you're going to talk to Dbus. Um, and um, you can interact with the Dbus API in this way. Uh, it's even easier than like, typing out the gdbus commands on the command line. And you know, that's really the whole point. So we're, we're logging into the system here. Uh, we're interacting with the system directly. Um, the JavaScript code is running in the uh, in the logging session. And, and really, this is like the key uh, sort of exciting feature of Kotlin is that um, the, the code is there, the JavaScript is interacting directly with the system, there's not all the layers you've got to go through. Um, it makes building admin tools a lot more fun and a lot easier. That um, you're not you know, dealing with layer after layer, it's your, you can talk directly to the system API if you want to talk to. And of course, it works both ways. Um, the, if you do something on the terminal, um, provided you know, it's a well implemented API, uh, immediately the browser is notified about it. The browser can update itself, the UI can change uh, in the appropriate way. Uh, here's another example uh, spawning a process. Again, it's just a simple one liner in the cockpit JS library. Uh, here, we're just spawning ping. Uh, it's pretty quick and easy. And you see that the output gets streamed back to the browser and you can just log it there. Um, and another simple example, uh, this is just reading a file. Um, you can specify the file name you want, copy the file, and uh, you get the contents of the file uh, streamed back to the browser. So, uh, of course, there's more supported operations, you know, things that you're going to want to do uh, on the file system. Uh, writing, writing files, monitoring, uh, connecting to sockets, um, doing HTTP requests. Um, but let's, let's move on and deal with specifics and talk about how it's all put together. So, if you're logging to the cockpit and look closely at uh, what runs after you log in, uh, you notice a process called Cockpit Bridge. Um, Cockpit Bridge doesn't know how to do things like things we showed before. It doesn't know how to, um, you know, create a bond or change uh, a filter or do anything like that. All it does is it receives messages on standard in and outputs messages on standard out. Um, an incoming message might be the instructions to open a connection to this email server. Talk with this thing in HTTP, read this file. And it's going to um, set those instructions, do what it knows how to do, and asynchronously uh, return the results or of, of those commands uh, uh, back on the standard app. Uh, the JavaScript code that runs in the browser, it's listening to those responses, and when it gets those responses, it reacts in the appropriate way and updates the UI. Um, obviously, the browser can't talk directly to standard in and out, so that's what the website is for. Um, 
the cockpit uh, WS or web service um, process uh, makes the web socket available to the browser uh, that it can use to pass messages in. Any message that it gets in, it passes along to the bridge. Any responses from the bridge, it sends it out, it passes back up, uh, to the web socket, and that's how the browser uh, can consume uh, One other little point here is that when you first log in, um, the browser obviously needs the JavaScript and the HTML and the stuff that's going to run, and so the Cockpit WS has a little web server and it to return that uh, to the browser as well uh, after the login. <coughs> So, uh, you're probably uh, wondering about security. Um, browsers authenticate with the system, how does this all work? Um, so, the key component of the login session is this identity. Who you log in as? Uh, I don't know if you know what the new registration to the system, uh, the way it works is the, the SSHD process is what authenticates you. It takes care of running your boot maps back, making sure that you have the right permissions, and then it uh, spawns your shell with a specific UID. So, Cockpit does pretty much the same thing. When, you're, when your browser um, first connects to Cockpit, you don't get um, the session, there's no bridge, you've got to authenticate first. You make the call to authenticate. Um, only after that happens, then you're able to start talking to the bridge. So, let's uh, take a look what happens when the uh, new logs in. You can see there's nothing going on, there's no Cockpit processes running at all. Um, uh, when you decide to hit it, that's when the cockpit web search process gets socket activated. Um, and it starts up, it's running as an unprivileged user, it doesn't really matter what the user is, especially if that SE link on the stuff permission to do almost nothing. Um, and it's just um, basically serves this page and gets the login. Uh, when you get a successful login, first of all, you see that there's a cockpit session process. Uh, it's running as a root. And it's the uh, SQID uh, binary, and it's what starts running your Google Pan stack. Um, you, it, it, it gets spawned, it checks the authentication, it uh, makes sure you have access, and then if all that passes, it starts up the copy uh, inside that session. Um, you can see the terminal inside of the cockpit, it's very clear, logged in here as the user step. It's a, Fully featured session, you can see it with login CTL. Um, you can use login CTL to query more about it. It's a regular Linux session. Um, so, everything that happens from this point on is running through the cockpit bridge um, with messages being packed back and forth, and that's being run as the user that's involved in it. So, uh, that's why you can say the JavaScript code is really running all in this session. Everything that it does, Asked to do is messages being passed to the cockpit bridge, which is running as a user. When the cockpit has to do something that involves a privilege escalation or something like that, it will try to use pseudo or circuit depending on uh, how the system is configured, what the scenario is, and it only succeeds if that user does in fact have those permissions to do that and you know, is able to escalate the pseudo or you know, pull or something like that. See here what happens when we log out. Uh, when we log out, the top bridge, um, bridge and session goes away, and then after a little bit, if nothing else is using the web socket that goes away as well, and there's nothing left. So, um, if you're running uh, the JavaScript as the logging user. You really want to be sure that only the code that you want to be running is in fact running the browser. Nothing else gets access to that web socket, nothing else gets access to that bridge. So, uh, preventing things like um, middle attacks, uh, XSS attacks, request for bridge, things like that, it's pretty important uh, for a programmer problem. So, we started uh, implementing um, a content security policy in Kotlin. It's not done really yet, uh, some components using it all the way, and some still have a few exceptions here and there. Um, but basically the idea is that it's sort of like, a rough comparison might be like SE Linux for the browser. And basically you, you can tell the browser that where the source of the JavaScript code is that you want to allow it to run on this page. So you can say, it's 
the code has to be served from the server, from these files, from this place, otherwise it doesn't matter. So if there's any kind of on clicks or emails in the code or um, inline script tags that get injected somehow or something, none of that's, the browser will refuse to run all that. You can see like, what the, the message looks like. And even stuff like C CSS you know, changes coming from outside, all that uh, get along. So that's pretty important to uh, you know try to help keep the security of what's running in the browser. Um, so one of the things that uh, you often expect uh, from a, a login session is that's we also run different tools or applications. So uh, you can see here sort of the the cockpit screen. There's a lot of different. Um, Packages, so those are the list of uh, tools and uh, services on the side there. And essentially, each one of those is sort of its own self contained um, package. They run in iframes and browser separate from each other, uh, and just interfere with each other at all. Um, there is like one overarching shell that kind of coordinates among them, but um, they're all pretty separate and they're often packaged very separately. A lot of times, they're using their own RPMs or distro packaging format is. Um, it's also really easy to build your own uh, bits of UI that interact with, uh, that they can use the cockpit JS library and talk to the bridge and do whatever. There's a lot of really good examples and I can't pull them all together, but uh, on GitHub, if you're interested in seeing how easy it can be to like, you know, throw up a custom, a custom mode of this for, you know, an to the tool that you use. Um, of course, as you see before, there's a fully featured terminal cockpit. Anything that runs in the terminal um, will run just as well in the cockpit if you want to do that. Um, so, MC example there. Um, pretty uh, standard stuff. Uh, this one here uh, is a little more uh, wild and crazy. Uh, this uh, is using uh, GTK to using Broadway, which is part of GTK, to run these GTK apps entirely on the browser. This works because GTK supports HTML5 rendering, uh, and it's got its own um, web socket um, support with Broadway. So, uh, you can take the cockpit provides the login section and wraps it. We're not actually talking to the Broadway web socket directly. Um, the JavaScript and the browser is talking to the bridge, which is then talking to the web socket login user and everything flows and you know you can use basic apps. It's more just like as an example of sort of what's possible um, using sort of the cockpit uh, transports. Um, each uh, cockpit component uh, can also be embedded in like a totally different application if you want. So you don't want the cockpit shell or maybe you want to really just have um, you know, different pieces integrated separately into, into your UI, you know, something else entirely. Um, they're all, you know, can be completely separated, and, you know, so here this is just an example, uh, sort of a different, different shell, a different wrapping, and we're exposing individual ones of the cockpit interfaces, um, you know, separately on their own. Um, everything about them works the same, it's still using the same transport, the same uh, type of logging session. Uh, it's just got a different sort of uh, wrapper around it. You know, it works. Um, doesn't look like the standard uh, cockpit. Uh, no. All right. Uh, so cockpit over SSH. Uh, normally, the way cockpit works, and all the examples we've been showing, is uh, we've been running the, the web server uh, directly on port. So that works for a lot of situations. A lot of other times, uh, you might not want to open ports uh, to the internet or you know even to a network. You might you might want to other ways that you might want to administer the server. So uh, one of the features of cockpit is that every server doesn't need to uh, uh, be connected to the browser directly, uh, and it can launch the bridge and the transport that I showed earlier via SSH. So you know maybe you 
uh, have one bastion server, for example, and that's the one that runs the, the Kafka WS components and everything else can make sense to the ASP. Uh, so this is an example of sort of um, adding multiple servers. So I've got one here is the primary server. It's the one that uh, serves the dashboard. And uh, the dashboard is where you, you know, add another server. So uh, here's an example, we're adding another server. We've got to confirm the fingerprint. It's like you would if you're using uh, SSH or terminal. Um, and in this case, uh, it all works uh, really quickly. Uh, the other server got the same user, the uh, same credentials. So uh, just log in right in. Uh, you're able to switch between them uh, easily. You can tell most, most of those copy components only work with one server at a time. The dashboard does show the graphs from multiple ones. Uh, so let's add an atomic host here. Um, the atomic ones are a little bit uh, different. A lot of times, especially with cloud servers, you don't have the same user accounts or the same, uh, or the same information. So same thing, you, uh, you log in, but it doesn't have the same, the same users. Um, so we want to log in with a key. Um, you can use the cockpit UI to load up uh, a key uh, in the browser that runs the SSH agent. Uh, again, it's part of the bridge. Uh, so we can try to log in with that. Um, again, the user's not the same, so we'll change the username to root. Because uh, that's the one where the key is authorized, and now you're able to get it. So every time it connects to this server, it's going to run everything as root. You can see it's a different server. Um, and if you check what it's running as, well, you can pull it to the root, so this server is doing root. Whereas your other servers, well, they're all doing, um, they're still all doing stuff. So, um, an interesting thing to note here is, I don't know if you noticed, but um, the list of available packages on the side uh, is different for every server. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, one is that, um, so, so the way it works is that every, every server supplies its own set of, H, of JavaScript packages to the browser that uh, the browser is going to run and render for like, what's available. Uh, one of the main reasons to do that is because, well, every server is different, right? Different software running on it. Um, you know, maybe some, some of your systems are atomic systems and you're running on OS3. Some of them have subscription managers, some of them don't. You know, there's all sorts of scenarios. So, you only install the packages, the JavaScript packages on that server that the ones you actually want companies to use. Um, another good reason for it is that um, every server's got its own bridge. And so the JavaScript packages only have to communicate with that bridge. So you don't have to worry about uh, version differences. So each server can work on a different version of the bridge, and JavaScript packages that work with that specific version of the bridge. Um, and you can run them all in the same session using uh, SSH to connect to them and it will all work because they only have to communicate with the bridge is the same version as that. Uh, so, uh, going back to sort of the graph, this is what it looks like. Um, again, our primary one, the one that serves the dashboard, really doesn't have to do much else. Uh, that one looks pretty much the same as before, but now, the WS process also can spawn off these other ones that use the SSH to spawn across this using cockpit bridge and then talk to those in the standard and standard app, just like it does in the local authentication. And in this case, whatever your, your hand stack looks like on the servers for SSH, that's what it's going to run through and that's what it means to authenticate um, each of them too. Uh, by the way, the port, you know, is configurable, so whatever SSH uses, you can uh, put that in the user if it shows configurable. So you can, you, you can have different users on different servers, you know, if that makes sense. And a lot of cloud environments are actually uh, how it assumes to the next year. Um, so for this feature, um, obviously it's not going to scale to thousands and thousands of servers. Um, and really that's that's not the point. That's um, it's one of the big differences between an interactive configuration thing like a cockpit or a decorative configuration thing is that. Uh, so with decorative, you're trying to say, you can say, okay, I want my services like this, I want you know, this install, this install, and configure like this, make it so. And then your configuration management, whatever it is, is going to go execute wishes, bring up, bring down servers, basic criteria, or whatever. And that's really not what a cockpit is. 
talk with about being interactive, which means that you want to publish something interactive when you want to look and inspect your system, see what's going on, discover what's available, what's not. Um, and you know, maybe you'll change the configuration to be to see how things are going. Um, but it's not about you know, declaring what things should be. Sometimes, obviously, the use cases might overlap, and you might want to do the tool like that, but to inspect and see what's going on on the server that you know, is initially driven by something like um, satellite or whatever, or something like that. Um, but generally, they're kind of in two kinds of similar use cases. Um, so, uh, contributes. Uh, we um, are always looking for more uh, active contributors. Uh, we, um, there's lots of ways you can contribute. Report bugs. Uh, we're on GitHub. Uh, join discussions. Ask for features. Uh, we use wikis to sort of people flesh out what a feature should look like. Um, do initial design and prototyping. Um, fix issues, of course. Uh, we are actively looking for a maintainer for uh, Union. So if anybody is interested, um, get in touch. Uh, we definitely need somebody there. Um, we, yeah, don't hesitate to post, you know, pull requests, and if it's not done, you want to, like, throw something over the wall, say, you know, here's, like, the little thing I did for this feature, you know, if we like working on our pull requests, we've actually integrated quite a few features with uh, that sort of thing, where someone sort of, you know, give an initial prototype that, you know, we work with them to, you know, um, clean up and fully integrate and then we to work with as a, you know, full-fledged uh, package or so. Um, so we're on GitHub. Um, uh, there's a wiki there. Um, Cockpit on Fino is where we hang out. Um, feel free to come by and ask questions. Uh, Steps websites. Uh, we've got a lot of good information on Cockpit as well. Um, yeah, and that's about it. Uh, I'm finishing a little bit early. If anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Otherwise, uh, Okay, I think I feel hard to do this for one. Any questions? Questions? Please wave. So I see. Thank you. 
focus on developers who are making developing pod or things for like administrator gets has the containers, they know what they need to run, they're bringing it up, managing services, replication sets, how many replicas they want, things like that. Um, there's still definitely ways to go. I think we have the basic feature set covered. Um, it's a post for both Kubernetes and uh, OpenShift Origin. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely usable both as part of the or uh, My server is crashed, how would you handle IPMI? I'm sorry. IPMI, how, you, how would you handle it in cockpits when a server is crashed? I don't want to use IPMI, but uh, yeah, the server inside the cockpit is also down, so how would you handle that in cockpits? Um, I mean, if, if, if the server is actually down and it's not accessible, um, I, I don't think there's a lot of cockpit can do there. Because um, again, it, it's all just going to be running on the, uh, on the server itself. Uh, I, I think that was the question. Any more questions? Doesn't seem so. So thank you very much for your talk.